Hi, I'm uh, really happy to be here. Uh, it's an honor to uh, come to, uh, uh, to, uh, to the college here, to the University of Sonoma State. Uh, I looked at the past uh, history of the folks that have given talks here, and I was pretty impressed. A lot of really great people, uh, and so it's kind of nice to at least uh, be at the tail end of some of these really, really wonderful folks that uh, discuss their physics with, with you. Uh, my goal, I think, is to primarily uh, talk about what I've done in, in my career, and it's pointed really towards the younger crowd of people that are either physicists or engineers, but I guess this is mainly physicists, uh, and kind of give you a flavor of what kind of a career, uh, I mean, mine would be one example of a, a physics career. There's, a, there's various kinds that people, uh, you know, some people uh, do one thing for 35, 40 years. That is absolutely not what I did. I did many, many, many things, in fact, probably too many things. Uh, and part of it had to do with the fact that I was interested in, in a wide assorted variety of things. Uh, and also because of just happenstance and things, you know, as things come along. And as headhunters give you a call and they say, hey, how'd you like to be, how'd you like to manage this department? Or, how'd you like to do this? How'd you like to do that? We'll give you a 30% increase. We'll give you, you know, a 20% increase. And you go, well, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> you know, that type of thing. And that's happened many times. Uh, I, I, it, it, most of the times when I've moved from place to place, it's, it's been primarily because of situations like that. Not to mention the fact that I have been laid off a number of times as well. Uh, but that gave me the option to do something, and I'll, I'll discuss that as well. Uh, I might as well bring it up right now. Is, um, in fact, let me, let, me, let me start right here. Um, these are a few of the companies that I worked at. There's probably three or four other uh, shorter term companies and a couple other startups that I don't have, oh, don't have here. But w what I did was I started out in, I started out with a master's degree at the University of Chicago. Uh, and uh, because of uh, family issues, you know, re particular reasons, I could not complete, uh, go on beyond the master's. So I went ahead and started working uh, for a semiconductor industry in Silicon Valley. And one of the interesting things was that uh, um, uh, uh, the first job that I had at National, for instance, was uh, uh, I walked in uh, uh, via, as a pedestrian, walked right in and asked, do they have any jobs? And I was from Chicago. So I had visited a friend of mine in Silicon Valley. He'd been working there for a few years. He says, plenty of jobs here. Go ahead and check it out. I went and checked it out. And he says, uh, uh, the, the manager says, well, we, we do have openings here. But we need to know, it's a semiconductor company. Would you rather work in bipolar or MOS? And I said, what in the heck is this man talking about? I didn't have a clue what he was saying. So obviously what they did was when they hired me, they put me in bipolar. <laughs> so I became a process engineer, and I did that for a while. I went into failure analysis. Then I went into Intel as a reliability device engineer. Uh, then at Cinertech, I became a manager. And I, was, uh, I had several positions as managers in several different companies, all in the semiconductor business. And then, after 18 years, I said, you know what? I've been meaning to get my PhD for the 18 years. I haven't done it, so let me go ahead and finish my PhD. So I called Gene Parker, Eugene Parker, who was my advisor, and he says, well, we'll have to check into this. So he went and you know, got a lot of information about what it would take to do that. And I was required to take one class uh, at San Jose State in semiconductor physics, I think, because I had gotten like a C or something in that class. And I was the oldest guy there, all these youngsters. I got the highest grade in, in the class, but the guy would not give me an A just because philosophically he did not give anybody A's. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> but anyway, it was a lot of fun. Uh, anyway, so um, I called up Gene. Gene says, I'm retiring in 10 months. If you can finish your PhD in 10 months, great. If you can't, you've got to go with somebody else. I said, fine, I'll finish it in 10 months. I finished it in 10 months. Uh, worked on uh, solar physics, dynamo theory. Uh, it was a theoretical work, so I did it here uh, locally, you know. I didn't have to go do experiments or anything like that. So I visited university several times, and we had discussions. I got my PhD. My uh, kids went to my, uh, uh, my uh, uh, you know, uh, coronation, what it's called. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, my, my wife, my, my parents, it was really cool. I was 47 years old when I got it. So it's a little bit advanced. University of Chicago says, uh, we don't think anybody at that age has gotten a PhD. You might be one of the few. So that was kind of fun. Anyway, uh, then I went to a national labs. I went to Lawrence Livermore Labs, did some work on neural networks. Uh, then there were a couple startups that I went to. They, they failed miserably, unfortunately, uh, not because of me. Um, and uh, so uh, then ultimately ended up at Lockheed Martin. 
And as, as you can see, I was a manager for three different companies. And I, when I got my PhD, I decided I want to do technical work. I really am not management material. I could be, but I really prefer not to. And so I just continued becoming, uh, basically did physics and uh, applied physics and engineering. Uh, and then finally, I recently retired. And uh, during all that time, we've had, uh, we developed two different companies, one called Geologic Vision for the uh, oil business, uh, to do sensors for the oil business. Uh, the idea there is to uh, uh, take a look at the, uh, um, at the shaking of the earth, you know, when you create uh, 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 seismic waves. Uh, and the idea is not to have things stuck in the ground to give you the sensing, but simply to do it in the air by using a specific type of optical sensor. So we're developing an optical sensor for that kind of business. Uh, and then uh, Bexis is another company. And that company, we're developing a half a dozen different products that I may discuss very briefly. And during all that time, we also, I was involved uh, a number of years ago in starting up a company called Kinetic R&D. Uh, and that uh, company uh, has been funded now for about nine or 10 years by the government for uh, an internal combustion engine, which I will discuss. So it looks like I'm not going to get through. <laughs> OK, uh, let's just go through. Uh, uh, an example of what I did in the failure analysis area. There's many, many failure modes, probably 20, 30, 40 different types of failure mechanisms that semiconductor devices can fail due to. This is one out of those. And uh, the idea is, uh, the, the particular one that I'm talking about, let's see, okay, is electromigration. And, and what happens in electromigration is you have metal uh, lines, you have you know, enormous numbers of these lines in integrated circuits. And what occurs is when current flows through these lines, they're aluminum lines typically, there's going to be a momentum transfer from the electron uh, wind, if, if you want to call it that, just similar to like a solar wind. There's a momentum transfer which takes and uh, creates, uh, uh, forces the, the aluminum, uh, uh, aluminum uh, uh, atoms to actually move and migrate. And I'll explain in detail on the, on the next page. And so one can see, for instance, that here there's a lack of material, and here's an excess of material. And it's in the direction of the electric field, uh, or the electrons are going from right to left, and you can see that they're pushing material to the left. Same thing is true over here. You can see in some cases this excess material can create what are called hillocks. Those hillocks can then short out adjacent lines. And that happens uh, quite regularly, uh, especially high current devices, analog devices, things like that. Um, now, there are ways to reduce that by putting copper into the material. So there's a lot of metallurgical types of approaches that can uh, reduce this kind of effect. But that's one type of failure mechanism. Uh, here's another example where a, a stripe opened up because the metal just simply continued to move away from that region. OK, then uh, there's uh, an example of electrical overstress, which is not a very sexy type of thing. But uh, quite often, devices will uh, die. Uh, because too much power has gotten uh, into the device for a variety of reasons, all, all, all types of reasons. This is electromigration a little bit more in detail. You can see that there's a, gra gra uh, a grain structure for the aluminum. And over here you can see that if you have, for instance, the electrons going from left to right, you're going to create excess over here. Is that right? Oh, that's backwards. I think whoever did that is wrong. Uh, <laughs> flip the electrons in the other direction then. Uh, but the point is, it's exactly as I mentioned before. Uh, there's going to be a, a shortage here. Uh, you know, it's inconsistent there, but just as I mentioned before. Uh, and uh, there's a guy by the name of Black that developed an equation that describes this kind of thing. And you can see right away that there's an E to the uh, uh, something over KT. So it's a chemical reaction, effectively. Uh, it's got an activation energy. Uh, and uh, so the mean time to failure goes something like this, where the current density is to some n power. And typically, n is on the order of 2. But there's lots of different models. People have worked on this for many, many decades. And it's, it's an interesting area. There's, like I said, many different failure mechanisms. Uh, and there's a lot of physics in, in these failure mechanisms. There are uh, conferences, uh, reliability physics symposium. I've published many papers there in all kinds of failure mechanism physics. A very, very interesting area. So you know, if you're not going to be doing uh, black hole theory, this is a pretty good area to work in. Uh, you actually get experiments, you get results, you can get some very interesting results. So uh, I, I would suggest that. Okay. 
Uh, here's another example of high, a high voltage event or electrostatic discharge. And you, you probably, everybody's aware of this, I, I'm sure. Uh, you know, you walk around, you know, shuffling your feet on a carpet, and then you touch your computer, and all of a sudden the computer stops functioning. Well, that's an ESD event. So it's a high voltage event. A lot of charge gets dissipated at high voltage. And we're talking about uh, 300,000 volts, 100,000 volts, up to a half a million volts. Uh, you know, a Van de Graaff generator provides that. When you shuffle your, your feet on a carpet, you can get up to a half a million volts, uh, very, very simply. The amount of charge is not a lot, the amount of current that you create is not, is not huge, but nevertheless, it's sufficient to blow these tiny, tiny little ICs. So, uh, that's another example of a failure mechanism. And the third example would be uh, dendritic growth. It's a chemical reaction which shorts out, say, uh, on a PCB, uh, say on a PCB board, or even on an IC or in an assembly of a whole bunch of uh, devices when you put them all together, uh, then you can actually get uh, uh, electrical shorting because of this type of effect. And this is due to moisture or, or contamination. But as I mentioned, there's, there's dozens and dozens of these things, and they're very, very interesting. If you ever get involved in this area, it's quite, quite good. And uh, here I'm just suggesting that uh, the typical behavior uh, for uh, uh, most of these types of failure mechanisms is the fact that it's an exponential to, to the activation energy over, over, over temperature. And uh, so basically that's effectively a chemical reaction. And that's really all, all these things are based on some type of chemical reactions. And the way you typically test these things is by using uh, temperature acceleration. Uh, you simply run a life test. You find out when it fails at three or four or five different temperatures. And then you can go ahead and uh, uh, try to plot this and determine what is the activation energy for that particular failure mechanism. Let's say it's electromigration. You find out that it's 0.9 EV. Or you do some other type of failure mechanism, fails for a different reason, and it turns out to be 0.6 EV. So all of these types of failure mechanisms have their specific activation energy. And again, in the same area, reliability failure rates uh, 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 basically uh, follow this kind of a bathtub curve. Uh, so this is now what we call reliability physics. There's failure analysis physics, namely mechanisms, and this is more a statistical approach uh, for how parts fail, when they fail, how often, and the rate of failure. And typically what happens is, initially, once you've built a bunch of parts, there's a very rapid early failure rate called infant mortality, which has to do with the fact that out of 1,000 parts, you have three that are defective. And so those parts fail within the first uh, you know, 48 hours. Then after that, you have a constant failure rate the, the bathtub curve is, is fairly, fairly constant, uh, and that's the useful lifetime of that device. But eventually, you're going to start to get failures which will increase in time, and that's a, a, an increasing failure rate area, and that's typically called the wear-out failure rate. In other words, a parts will not last forever. They may last 20 years, uh, and every, uh, in semiconductors, typical parts will definitely last 20 years. In some cases, they'll last 40 years. So, so this is a typical kind of uh, uh, thing that parts uh, behave as. And uh, this is the Arrhenius equation that we had on the other page. And so again, what you do is you take uh, different temperature. Uh, this is time to fail, sorry. Uh, time to fail uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, for at temperature one. Time to fail at temperature two. And here's temperature one and temperature two. And from that experimental data, you can go ahead and calculate what that activation energy is. And each specific failure a, a, a mechanism has its own unique activation energy. So here's an example uh, of oxide defects, 0.3 to 0.5. Uh, a corrosion is just under 0.5 EV. Uh, here's the electromigration one I was mentioning to you. The two different kinds of, uh, there's many more. Aluminum is the one we were talking about, but there's also a contact via electromigration where the line goes into a diffusion and it's a contact that goes into the silicon. That is also electromigration. Things can open up uh, due to electromigration movement of aluminum, but uh, it has a different activation energy. Okay, so that was failure analysis. When I was at Intel, we helped develop uh, the first 
EE prom, electrically erasable prom. In other words, the first non-volatile non memory that was both programmable and erasable electronically by just putting a voltage across it. Now, everybody today knows everything about this. I mean, you know, everybody's got these little pocket uh, sticks, uh, memory sticks. They're all based on, on, on this, which was brand new back in, uh, in 78 when I worked on this. So I, my primarily uh, thing that I worked on was I needed to understand how these things fail because we didn't know, uh, you know, whether this will last long or not. But let me briefly mention what, what, what we're talking about here. This is a cross-section for what's called a Flodox device. There's a, a gate here made of polysilicon. There's a gate here made of polysilicon. There's a contact here to the top gate, and you control that with the gate voltage, VG. Over here, this particular uh, uh, polysilicon piece is completely isolated from everything. In other words, there's oxide on top, oxide on the bottom. It's electrically completely isolated. So the concept is that if you can raise this voltage high enough, there's a very thin 100 angstrom oxide region here, and that's what's called a tunneling oxide region. You can then tunnel electrons from this high, uh, high uh, uh, reservoir. This, this is a source and, and, and uh, uh, a source and drain. Uh, in here, there's tons and tons of electrons. You can tunnel ele uh, quantum electronically uh, to this uh, floating gate. Once it's there, it's stuck forever. It'll be there for 30, 40, 50 years. And uh, so this is the basic uh, cross struct uh, structure that, that, that we worked on. And of course, it, it turned out to, to work extremely well. The reliability was very, very good. Uh, there were still particular failure mechanisms we had to investigate, you know, early failure type mechanisms. But in general, once it passed uh, beyond the early failure rate, it lasted 20, 30 years. And the idea is you program and you charge and discharge, charge and discharge 10,000 times. Uh, and today, I think you can probably do 20, 40,000 times. And you never lose any charge, effectively. So I worked on that. Uh, and here's, again, an example of what's going on. If you want to put electrons in here, you simply tunnel the electrons from here to here by putting a high a gate voltage. And by high, I don't mean 1,000 volts. I'm talking about, you know, 7 volts, 10 volts, 15 volts. Um, so here's the programming voltage, 10 to 15. And you can program uh, uh, the effective threshold and changes for this device because now you've got electrons sitting here, so it increases the threshold. And that could be called a logic one if you want. So now you've got a logic one programmed into this cell. You can do a logic zero by erasing. Uh, but when you start out with electrons, you can then get rid of the electrons. And now you've got a logic zero, and the threshold is very low. So when the threshold is low, it's zero. The threshold is high, it's one. What's interesting about this is, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, the, the fact that you can actually take electrons out of here, discharge them way beyond normal so that you end up with positive charges here. That's also a possibility. And if one can do that, that brings up some very interesting topics because now you've got a device with negative charge and you have another potential device with positive charge. Now you've got more stuff to work with than you normally would, would have to work with. Some interesting devices can be made this way. Nobody's done it yet, but I'm working on something like that. Okay, University of Chicago, my thesis was on the possibility of having a fossil magnetic field stuck in the core of the sun. When the sun got formed billions, tens of billions of years ago, there was a nebulous gas, and it basically contracted, and there was an ambient field in that region, magnetic field, and that, you know, it's a plasma, so therefore, uh, 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 magnetic fields get entrained to the plasma. They basically are stuck in the plasma. So you move the particles around, the, pla the, the magnetic fields stay with you. So what happens is you've got this large ball of gas. It gets contracted into the sun. And the question then is, well, is there a, med a magnetic field in the core that came from you know, this relic uh, uh, ambient magnetic field from, from way in the past? And uh, so that's the question that I was going to answer. That requires some knowledge about uh, what's called dynamo theory. I don't know if you have any experience in dynamo theory or looked at it, but uh, Gene Parker was one of the experts in that area. Uh, and in fact, uh, before I get to that, let me just, let me just briefly uh, mention that the, the structure of the sun uh, has a core, 
has a radiator zone and it has a convective zone. In the core, of course, you're creating all this nuclear energy. Pretty much that's what the core does. In the radiative zone, you're radiating that energy to the outside uh, as radiation. But then in the convective region, about the top 30%, you're actually convecting. You've got these big swells. It's an unstable region. And so therefore, a lot of that energy comes through the convective process uh, to the surface. And just to, to, to mention, what is, what is dynamo theory? Well, dynamo theory tries to explain why the sun and even the galaxy and even the moon or the earth, why they have magnetic fields. Where does it come from? They are constantly being regenerated. What's the process? So it, this is an explanation. Uh, and the explanation basically is relatively simple. If you have a body, like the earth or the sun, it's rotating. It also has a source of energy. So it's hot inside and cooler on the outside, or towards, towards the outside. So if you rotate, and there happens to be a small seed <coughs> magnetic field, some small amount of magnetic field sitting there, what will happen is the rotation portion will take magnetic fields and wrap itself around so that now the magnet, any, any ambient magnetic field will now be circular, what's called toroidal. At the same time, of course, you have convection going on. So that toroidal field will have upwelling because of the convection, and you'll create a little loop like this. But remember, it's still twisting, right? And usually, uh, in bodies like this, you have uh, a variation in the twist as a function of, of, alti of, 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 uh, of depth. So therefore, you get this shearing effect. And so therefore, it gets sheared into a loop like this, which has a component that's in the poloidal direction, namely the poloidal direction is what we normally look at when we look at objects and they have this normal magnetic field. That field is called the poloidal field. Field like this is called toroidal. So anyway, so the process is, is understood, but the first person that did that was Gene Parker back in 1955. And so I, I took this uh, same concept and kind of uh, improved on it a little bit, uh, which I won't go into that, but uh, again, uh, this is a, a, uh, an explanation, again, of what I just talked about. You start off with some kind of a magnetic field. It gets wrapped around like this into this type of a shape. And then eventually the upwelling or the convection creates these loops. Those loops eventually uh, occur all over uh, that body, right? They're all small loops which then basically diffuse into each other and create a very large loop. And that diffusion process then gives you this poloidal field. Uh, and once you've got the poloidal field, uh, then that field dif basically diffuses away. It's always dying, effectively, in, in time. And, uh, and the process just, just, just continues. So it's a continuous process. And obviously, you need to have an energy source. You need to have rotation. And you need to have, uh, well, that's basically it. So it's a very interesting thing. Uh, very mathematical uh, in my. Uh, when, when I did my PhD, um, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah. Um, they looked at my paper, and I had an equation, well, several equations that were like four or five pages long. And they looked at it, and they said, you've got to be kidding me. You actually solved, you, you did a hand solution. You know, today, nobody does that. Today, everybody has, you know, computer uh, you know, code. You know, they get numerical results. But I did this uh, horrendous uh, thing, and so they were kind of surprised about that. But anyway, uh, so the point here is that if you take a look at the data for the solar magnetic field during the solar cycle, and everybody is aware that it's a 22-year cycle. Every 22 years, you go from north, the north turns into south pole, and, the, and then it turns, the south pole turns back into the north pole. Every 22 years, that occurs. Uh, if you take a look at the actual data of the magnetic field, you find out that there's an asymmetry. When it's pointed, when it's one half of the cycle, and you take a look at the value of the magnetic field above and below, it's not the same value. It's off by roughly four Gauss. Um, and the question then becomes, is that important or not? It turns out that it is important. And in fact, it's very 
consistent. So that means that there's something going on that has an asymmetry of four Gauss. This is over a number of different uh, cycles that this has been discovered over, I think it's like the last 60 years, 50, 60 years roughly. And it turns out that one can take this and use dynamo theory and then go into the core and deduce what the potential uh, uh, field might be due to a supposed uh, primordial or relic field in the core and then go back and say, that type of a field will give me this four Gauss asymmetry. And if one does that, then one finds out that a self-consistent theory shows that there might be a primordial field in the solar core, but it's not big. It's not a million Gauss where you hide this enormous field. It's very small. It's only 30 Gauss. So when I wrote my thesis, there were a number of people that were uh, not happy about this result because they had come up with theories as to why there should be uh, 2 million Gauss in the interior of the sun to explain some theories that they were working on. And my, my work simply showed that you cannot really have a very large magnetic field in the solar core. But the physics was really, really a lot of fun. That was, that was a nice, nice thing. Okay. When I started working at Lockheed Martin in Sunnyvale, which is the space systems group, my, my specific job there was as a survivability engineer slash scientist. And we were supposed to study when spacecraft go wherever they go, are there things that occur to them where you, know, you can get failures? And one of them is heavy ions, cosmic rays, things like that, radiation effects of all kinds. And so my goal was to understand and do some experiments and also do theory and understand how some of these things can harm integrated circuits. So here's an example of a OP27, which is an operational amplifier. Those of you that uh, do a little bit of uh, circuit theory or, or use, you know, do experiments, right? You use op amps up probably. And if you open up one of these guys, and this is a relatively old one now, you know, because this is, this is a few decades old. But I, I imagine that even today, I'm sure that they're built, you know, there are probably chips that look very similar to this. But you have a bunch of capacitors. You've got one, two, three, four large capacitors that are integrated onto the chip. And the capacitor is composed of a metal top, a dielectric, namely oxide, and then silicon underneath. And so the question is, you take this and you, you, you fly this out in outer space, something happens, you take a look and try to figure out where the short occurs, why it's failing. And we're going to take a look, I think, over here on the next page. That's what happens. This is due to a heavy ion impact. And then the question becomes, OK, well, so what does that mean? I mean, a heavy ion, you know, first of all, a heavy ion is very light. I mean, you know, it's, it's not very heavy, right? It doesn't have a lot of mass. Why would it create something like this? Well, the answer was, and I showed how one does that, is that a heavy ion creates an, an enormous trail of electrons and holes in a semiconductor. Remember, semiconductor has both positive and negative charges, holes and electrons. OK, so let, let's go through some of the really basic physics here. Uh, there's a column. Uh, where's my little? Uh, oh, here it is. OK. Uh, so here's a column. Uh, here's a heavy ion coming through. It creates positive and negative charges. Now remember, this is a capacitor. This is aluminum. This is uh, the interface between silicon and the, this is the oxide. And there's an electric field here, right? Because you're biasing up a capacitor. So there's a, you know, this is at, you know, whatever it is, 20 volts, 15 volts. And so there was an electric field uh, because of the battery, right? Uh, but remember, there's charges here. So obviously, there's going to be some electric fields due to that. So the question is, what do you have here? And the answer is kind of the following. Here's an ion coming through. This represents the electric field because this is biased up at some voltage. This is grounded. This, again, is silicon. This is metal. And this is some battery. So you've got this field that points in the downward direction. As the particle goes through, it creates electrons and holes all the way down. And eventually, disappears. It doesn't do any damage, by the way. 
in itself doesn't do any damage. It's all this other stuff that does the damage. So now, uh, once you've got this column created, then the, the negative charges want to go up, right? Because you've got this electric field here. So they go up, they disappear, and what you're left with then is this positive charged column. Now, any positive charged column is going to give you an electric field, right? And so I've represented this here. If this is some uniform column, which it isn't, but it is, say, it's uniform, then I'm going to have a field, you know, there'll be zero over here, right in the middle. There'll be a positive charge here, positive charge in that direction, effectively symmetric. So you can see what's going on. If you're, uh, if you're talking about this region up here, you're going to have this field plus that field. If you're talking about this region here, you're going to have this field plus that field. It's going to be an asymmetry there. Uh, let's see. Let's go to this one here. And this represents the ultimate result, is when you take a look at the top, which is the metal SiO2 interface, you're going to get a relatively small uh, field that's in one direction from zero. But then at the bottom, at the silicon, silicon dioxide interface, you're going to have a very, very large field. So in one case, they subtract. In the other case, they add. And this briefly is just uh, kind of the steps of what goes on. Uh, for every 17.4 electron volts of ion energy lost, you have one electron hole pair that are created. So roughly speaking, you're going to get almost a tenth of a million electron hole pairs created in something extremely thin on the order of, uh, you know, maybe a fraction of a micron. So that's a lot of charge. So holes get trapped in the oxide. They don't move. Uh, but the electrons drift and they disappear. And so you end up with something like this. Now, here's the trick. You have this external electric field from the battery, right? And then you have this internal oxide field that's created from the positive column. If the sum of those two is equal to the intrinsic oxide breakdown, then the oxide will break down. Now, what is that oxide breakdown value? Well, that's an experimentally determined value. There's theory behind that, and I worked a little bit on that as well. But every oxide, every material, every dielectric has its own intrinsic breakdown. Once you go be beyond that critical value, you break down the dielectric. And so, so, for instance, if one knows what this number is, and one knows what the battery voltage is, then you can calculate what the electric field is internally created uh, in, in, in that oxide, in, in the capacitor. You can play a lot of games like that. And, and by the way, this, is, uh, this takes less than a picosecond, this entire process. OK, we talked about that. Um, I'm not going to go through anything fancy here. All I want to point out is that the equations are relatively straightforward. They may not be simple to solve, but they're straightforward. Uh, it's diffusion, drift diffusion equation. That's all that occurs, right? And so you have a diffusion term, right? There's a del squared term, Laplacian. Uh, you, this is for holes here. P is holes, N is electrons. Identical equation for both. Uh, you have a radial drift, right? You have a lots, of lot, lots of electrons, let's say. Well, they, they want to expel each other. They want to push each other away, so therefore you get diffusion in that, in that direction, which is radial. I'm sorry, that uh, drift, I'm sorry. Drift, not, not diffusion. Then you get axial drift at the electric field, that external electric field. You want to go down that pipe. Uh, then you get recombination, right? Electron holes recombine. And then also you get impact ionization. So you're creating. In other words, that's the creation term. That's the, that's the electron hole pair creation term. Anyway, so one does and, and can calculate this, and one usually does this numerically, although uh, I was able to do it actually by hand uh, because I made some simplifying assumptions. And again, if briefly, what happens is you start off with this very large charge distribution. And very rapidly, what happens is it diffuses and gets wider and wider, and then it reaches a maximum width, and then it simply recombines. In other words, it just dies out very slowly through recombination. There's a maximum amount of width, doesn't go any further, and then it just recombines. So if you, if you make some uh, simple, simplifying assumptions, you can come up with a very simple integral, uh, which I won't explain. But then you do a numerical solution for this critical electric field, which is this field uh, that is created uh, uh, due, to the, due, to the, uh, due to the ion. And then when one does that, then one says, okay, now we understand 
how much voltage you can put across this. If you go beyond that, you're going to break the device if it's in the environment of cosmic rays or, or this type of uh, uh, heavy ion environment or, 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 or whatever. So one then can plan and can, can uh, design, right, your chip, design the electronics so that it doesn't fail. And based on the theory that I developed, we're able to show that the results are really quite good. So for instance, here we have a nickel ion. We we're, talking about, we we're talking about ions. Bromine, iodine, and gold. There's many, many ions, but these are, these are pretty heavy ions in terms of where they are on the periodic table. And you can see that the predicted uh, and the actual experimental is you know, pretty, pretty close. So that was, uh, that was actually uh, a lot of fun to do. OK, something brand new, something different. Uh, when I worked at Lawrence Livermore, over here, they had a project that Bjork Shiley, the company that produces mechanical valves for people that have heart problems, they were starting to fail very prematurely. And that's a problem, right? Because a person's walking around and all of a sudden the uh, valve is not working the way it should. You got to put him on the operating table. You got to open up his chest. And you got to take that take that valve up. So the question is, how are they failing? Why are they failing? And can we predict which people need to go under the knife? Because it'd be better, you know, you're not you're not going to go and take everybody under the knife. That's not a good solution. But only the ones that are absolutely necessary to have to, you know, undergo this procedure. So the question is, how does one do that? Well, what we did was we developed an artificial neural network that was able to classify defective versus good uh, valves. Here's a, a picture of uh, the kind of valve we're talking about, bjork Shiley convexo concave valve. It's a mechanical contraption, and it's you know, supposed to replace uh, the natural valves that we have here, uh, the aortic valve or the mitral valve. And it makes a lot of noise, too. So that's good, because we can take the acoustic signal, do some signal processing, and then, by some magic, hopefully, uh, using a neural net that gets trained on both good valves and bad valves, uh, then determine, uh, you know, take uh, 50, uh, uh, 50 patients and determine that patient 1, 3, and 5 have a defective valve, but all the other guys don't have a problem. And that's basically what the project was all about. So I developed a, an artificial neural net called a probabilistic neural net. A little bit different than kind of net maybe that you guys may or may not be aware of. But it's based on a Gaussian uh, kind of approximation of the features that you want to classify. Uh, and, uh, but other than that, it has a very similar kind of uh, architecture in that it has a layer where you put in the features. It has a hidden layer that does the kind of the calculating the heart of it. And then it has a, classify, a, class, a classification layer and uh, again, you know, this is very, very small compared to the reality of what it is. But the idea here is that you put in features, right? And these are signal processing features, you know, uh, 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 acoustic signals from one frequency to another frequency. Many, many, many types of features that, are, that you go and, and, and do signal processing on, feed it into the net. It does its magic, and then it decides good or bad. And if you're familiar at all with them, it's all, you know, it's the, the original concept came from the fact that the brain, uh, you know, has neural, neural, uh, neural nets, essentially. And so that's, that was the initial uh, concept when they started with this idea. Uh, so here's an example of a bunch of features. And you smooth them out to give you some kind of a, a smoother version of those features. And uh, so there's a whole summation of these guys. This is the equation. And at some point, you make a decision. If it's greater than such and such, than this threshold, then it's this class. If it's less than this uh, thing, then it's the first class. And that's basically what we did. The nice part is that we did double blind testing after we did the, uh, the, the training. And it turned out that we were able to get 100% accuracy. It's very rare. Now, again, that was a one-shot test. I mean, uh, there were something like uh, 75 patients. but. Out of 75 patients, we got 100% accuracy. So that, that told us that this approach can work and probably will work. 
Okay, let's go on to something different. Uh, okay, I, I got to move along, I guess. Uh, here's a concept that uh, uh, one of the startup companies that, I, that I'm involved in that, that we started some time ago. Uh, we wanted to take some simple concept like a water meter, which is what this is. Water goes in, water goes out. It makes this thing kind of move around. It calculates the volume of the water going in. And the idea is, can we use this concept and, and create an internal combustion engine that is better than today's internal combustion engines? And the answer is, yes, you can. So here is uh, something from Popular Science. This is, a, again, a nutating water meter. And what we did was basically nothing more than just, in addition to having this stop that, you know, there's a left side and a right side here, we added another stop up here. So now we have two chambers on the left, one above, one below and two chambers on the right, one above and one below the disc. So it's just a single disc. And what I'll do is I'll show you basically what our prototype looked like. So here you can see that this is the disc I'm talking about, that it sits in this, in this region, and you can see that it, uh, there's a conical up lower part. Well, not conical, it's actually flat. But you notice that the disc is conical in shape. And so therefore, there's going to be a line of contact that separates, for instance, if, if, if there's a line of contact right here that's between the disc and this uh, uh, surface, then it's going to be a left, uh, to the left of that line of contact and to the right of that line of contact. Those are two separate chambers. And so the idea is that now you've got all the chambers that you need. Maybe you can create an internal combustion engine. Is it, is it good for anything? Well, here's a little better uh, idea of what we're talking about. And you can see that there's a front left and front right and then a back left and a back right chamber. Those are the four chambers that I'm talking about. And I'm comparing this with a typical four-piston reciprocating engine. And you can see that this takes a lot more space than this does, because all of the working volume is very close to each other. So therefore, the idea is, well, maybe this has the possibility of having much higher energy density, output power density. Maybe. And that was the idea that we started with. Now, some advantages, one moving part, one major moving part, that's it, just the disk. Uh, and uh, there's a, lots of other advantages. Here's an example of one that we built, which is a 10 horsepower mutating engine. This is, you can hold it in, in your hand and it's 10 horsepower. Usually an internal combustion 10 horsepower engine is gonna be about three times the size of that, of the same power. This is a dual disk. I'll show you what a dual disc is. Here's one disc, here's another disc, and they're connected. And uh, so you can see that there's ways of connecting one disc. You possibly can even get three discs if you want. So you can make it more powerful and more powerful if you want to. But again, it takes a certain amount of engineering. And all I'm showing here is that I developed the, uh, the basic engineering equations, the physics equations for the thermal the dynamics, the kinematics, you know, all of the stuff that you would need in order to design this type of an engine and to understand it. And so this is where, you know, your knowledge of physics comes in uh, or, you know, applied physics or if you're a really good engineer, you probably know, you know, the, the appropriate equations. You can go ahead and do that as well. But uh, so that's, that's where that comes in. Now, here's the numbers that we were able to crank out and uh, uh, compare. We're comparing here a Rotax engine for a, a small airplane. It's got cylinders that are radial, coming in like this, but they're all reciprocal. They go up and down, up and down. Ours don't. So what we did is we compared the total displacement, the effective volume displacement in the cylinders for both of them. We made them roughly the same. The horsepower is roughly the same. The RPM is the same. The compression ratio is the same. And the cycles that we're using, it's a four-cycle engine. Intake, compression, uh, combustion, and exhaust. And it has four pistons. Ours has two discs. Notice that the weight of the Rotax is 125 pounds. Ours is only 36. The horsepower output per pound for theirs is about a half. Ours is 2.2. And the volume, roughly speaking, is 3.5 to 0.75. So you're talking about a huge, huge difference. So our weight is basically 71% less. The
the output, output power to weight is three and a half times as great as a standard reciprocating engine. Uh, the engine size is 80% smaller, so it's only 20% as big, and the power to engine size, uh, the, you know, the power ratio is roughly four and a half times as, as great. So as I mentioned before, that we're currently being funded, we're, we're still working on prototypes, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to complete that and see how it works. The goal here is to put this into UAVs. That's one of the, one of the, big, one of the big goals, UAVs. Very weight sensitive. But you can stick this in a motorcycle. You can stick this uh, in a lawnmower. You can do a lot of things with it. And it runs on many, many different kinds of uh, fuel. Because the Army wants heavy fuel. You know, they, they're very specific as to what they want. It runs on lots of different kinds of fuel. Anyway, one of the advantages, uh, big advantages, is there's power overlap. Here is a single piston, a two-stroke piston. You, here's a power stroke. Here's a power stroke. Here's a one-piston, four-stroke engine. Only has one power stroke. Ours has power, 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 overlap power. These here are the actual power strokes, but you can see that there's overlap here, 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 and here. The other engines don't have any overlap. That's another advantage to the engine. It's smoother, the torque is smoother, and all that kind of stuff. There's a whole bunch of, uh, whole bunch of things like that. I better, I better get moving here. Uh, all I want to do is show you here roughly a little bit of an animation so you get a little bit of a feel. I'm going to jump forward a little bit. So you can kind of see right here, that's intake and then compression. Intake and then compression. So each side has intake compression and they're off by 90 degrees. So there's overlap. And then what I'll do is I'll show you the other side, the combustion side. You can see the spark plugs over there, they're igniting. You can see combustion on the right there, red. And then the yellow is exhaust. So that's a very nice little movie to get a, get a feel for really what I'm talking about as opposed to, because the geometry here is very complex in terms of mathematics and just understanding it's very tough. So it takes a lot of effort. Uh, but a nice picture like this is very, very handy to have. Okay. So we'll uh, finish that. And I think that we're probably not going to be able to uh, do too much. Let, let me briefly just uh, mention what this is. Uh, also at Lockheed, I worked on a material science project where we're trying to create uh, matrix materials where you have conductors inside of a matrix that's not conducting. And uh, they're useful for all kinds of purposes, like you want to build conductors of a certain conductivity uh, for uh, uh, stealth purposes, you know. So there's their conductors and waves come in and you either absorb them or you reject them or you do something to them. So the idea was how do you, can you do something like this in a scientific manner? You know, throw a bunch of ball bearings inside of a vat and come up with the conductivity you want to come up with. And so the idea was to do exactly that. So the concept was to uh, do some modeling where you have a, uh, a million sites and you throw ball bearings into these million sites, but how many do you throw in? A number n, 10,342, okay? And as you keep increasing that number, you randomly throw them in. At some point, you're gonna get conductivity. In other words, and, 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 and uh, the question is, what is that number? What's that critical number called the percolation number? So basically, that's, that's what I was involved in. And here's an example of a thousand by thousand bins or points. And I want to fill 59% of those with some kind of a conducting material. And you can see that there are clusters being formed. So these are all color coded. So the yellow cluster is one cluster. It's the same physical cluster. The, the, you know, the, the light blue, the dark blue, the very dark blue, the red, and so forth are independent clusters. So if you were to put a current through there, you would actually, that would be all at one potential, each one of those clusters. And um, so the idea is, let's do that and take the cluster that actually is the largest cluster and find out the probability number, the number at which you actually get conductivity. So if you go to here, and let me just go on further. 
you can see that what I've done is I've taken all the other clusters out and only kept the ones that actually go from left to right. You can see that there's contact here, here, but not here, but somewhere here, somewhere here, and on this side. So what I do is I put a voltage on this side, I put a ground on this side, and ask the question, will this conduct or not? And so it turns out that there's a critical number at which it conducts. And this one can be determined theoretically what that number is. Uh, it, it, unfortunately, it can't be done in a nice fashion. It's usually done numerically, because the theory actually is not as good as, as simply trying to do the numerics. So anyway, here's one that's a 1,000 by 1,000, the same kind of thing. You can see that the value for this one was 0.59. And so you can play games like this. And it turns out that there's a model that you can come up with and calculate the conductivity by knowing the filler uh, volume fraction, in other words, the non-conducting part, uh, or the conducting part versus the non-conducting part. And then also the critical probability number, like I said, 0.59 in that case. And there's an exponent here. So one can come up with a model and then compare against the experiment. Anyway, I can't talk about stealth physics, unfortunately. Uh, very, very interesting area. If you ever do classified work, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. However, you can't put stuff on your resume. You can't t tell people what you're doing. And that's a negative. And then finally, I want to talk about one thing that I did was um, an EMP wave. You have a nuclear blast. That nuclear blast creates a very large electromagnetic pulse called an EMP. You have a rocket or a missile that's flying. It has a plume. That plume is conductive. This electromagnetic wave hits this conductive plume, creates currents. These currents go inside the missile and blow up the missile. Okay? One wants to avoid things like that. So the problem is not very complicated. It's simply Maxwell's equations with boundary conditions. But one has to, you know, do this kind of thing uh, you know, correctly. So this shows the conductivity or the temperature as a function of altitude. It changes as a function of altitude. The entire plume characteristic changes as the rocket goes up. So one has to model that as well, depending on how high it is, how low it is, and what the EMP wave looks like. And then this, uh, all I was going to do was just show you, uh, there's an there's a EMP pulse coming from the left this way. This is air. I only did a little piece of the air. This all is air, really. This is a, a very cheap little model of the plume. You see, it's, it's, it's not very continuous. It's just in pieces because it's not, not easy to do. You, know, you have to have a heck of a computer. Uh, but the idea is uh, when that pulse comes, it creates all these various interesting nodes that kind of go back and forth. So it gets relatively complicated. And one from that, one can then calculate what kind of currents are induced, and then what, and the rocket is up here, and this is the tail, the bottom, and one has to then determine, is there a sufficient amount of energy being, being put into the electronics of the, of the system to, to create a problem? Anyway, this is something that I'm currently working on. I'm trying to develop a very lightweight x-ray shield based on diffraction rather than absorption. Very interesting little project. Uh, we are developing uh, on one of our companies a very, a very, very lightweight power generator that's based on electrostatics and not electromagnetics. And we know how to do that. We think we can do it. Uh, we have an approach to increase the efficiency of current solar cells without developing brand new solar cells. New physics. We don't need that. We have an approach where we can take current solar cells, slap something on there, and improve the efficiency right then and there. We hope. And then finally, we're working on a a bearing that is frictionless, again, it's based on electrostatics. So there's a lot of electrostatic related type of things that we are interested in applying that concept for a lot of different purposes. Okay, this is the last one. What this is, is I did some research online, and in fact, some people came up to me one time and said, what's your name, Baruta? I said, yeah. Well, do you know that the word Baruta means devil? in Polish, and I said, you got to be kidding me. So I went online, and sure enough, I found this. This looks like a drunkard. He doesn't look like a devil. This definitely looks like a devil. 
And if you go online, you find all kinds of pictures of, of what they called uh, Baruda. <laughs> so uh, anyway, this is very interesting. I figured, why not uh, finish off my talk with this uh, little interesting tidbit? OK, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>